250-250 in your hymnal. There is with my, in my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Let's all stand together as we sing 250 on that verse together. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. singing this morning good to see you in church today looking forward to a wonderful lord's day this morning and i uh, appreciate you making the time and being here to, together today let's open with a word of prayer shall we heavenly father we bow before you now this morning we thank you for another lord's day that you've given to us and the opportunity for us to come together we remember the promise that you made when you said two or three gather together there am i in the midst and lord we desire your presence to be here and in a real way, Lord, meet with us this morning. We don't just want to go through the motions and say we went to church today. We want to leave in a little bit saying that you met with us today. And so we yield ourselves to you and we pray that you'll speak to our hearts today. Use the music and use the preaching of your word to make us all a little bit more like Christ because we were here this morning. May you be pleased with the service today and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Early days, 
Just a little while to stay here. Just a little while to wait. Just a little while to labor in the path that's always straight. Just a little more of trouble in the slow and sinful state. Then we'll enter heaven's portals, sweeping through the pearly gates. Then we'll enter heaven's portals, sweeping through the pearly gates. All right, 283, 283. I have found his grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. I have joy unspeakable and full of glory. 283. Let's sing that first together. I have found his grace is all complete. Need while I sit and learn at Jesus' feet. I am free as free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory. Full of glory, it is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. I have found the pleasure I once craved. It is joy and speech within. What a wondrous blessing! Now listen carefully if you would. We have a few announcements for you and our regular schedule of services today at 530 tonight. We have a Christian growth class and uh, we meet in the conference room, which is down across from our nursery. And uh, tonight's lesson is going to be on the last days. And uh, are we are we there? And the answer is yes. Uh, we've been there for quite some time. And uh, we just don't know when exactly the last day will be. And by the way, no one does. Amen. And uh, if anybody says they do, they're not quite being honest with you. We've seen a lot of those date setters come and go, have we not? But uh, the, we just are going to be ready for when the Lord comes. But uh, we'll talk about that this evening, 530 in the Christian growth class. Then 630 tonight, we'll be back here in the auditorium for the evening service. And tonight, Lord willing, I'm going to talk to you on the subject, it takes three to make a marriage. All right? Sometimes we think two's company and three's a crowd. No, three's just right. And uh, we'll talk about that this evening from what the Bible says about how it has three to make the marriage. All right. Then reminder, next Sunday will be November 1 and Saturday night. You get an extra hour. All right. Fall back and uh, you get to get an extra hour of sleep on Saturday night. Uh, so remember to set your clock back so you'll be on time for services next Sunday. OK. All right, we want to take a moment now this morning and welcome any guests we have with us in the service. We're always pleased when folks visit with us. And uh, if you're visiting this morning and not a member here at Bible Baptist, would you just honor us by raising your hand? Brother Ross, you have your family here this morning, all right? Go ahead and introduce everybody to us. Would you, Ross? Would you do that? Can you do that? Maybe I should have. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Great to see these folks this morning. These are uh, folks that are at the YMCA every morning uh, at 530. They have the whole crew there. And uh, these uh, I've watched these girls go from playing in the water to swimming through the water. And uh, some of them are very good swimmers now. And if they're a little reluctant to get in, mom encourages them. 
by pushing them in. Amen? And uh, <laughs> It's a delightful, delightful family, and uh, it's great to see them visiting this morning. Thank you for being here, Brother Ross. Brother Ross was a police officer in the city of Columbus for, I think, 28 years, if I remember right, 27 years, and uh, uh, appreciate appreciate you being here this morning. Thank you. The usher should have given you a card to fill out, and if you'll be kind enough to fill that out for us, we appreciate that. A little bit, we have the offering. Just put the card in there. Keep the pen as our gift to you for coming today. We're glad you're here. Anybody else today for the first time? We have one over here. Lindy, who do you have with you today? Kayla Kayla from Florida. How about that? Good to see you, Kayla. Great to meet you. I understand today's your birthday. Is that right? It is. How about that? And you are a grand total of 22. Is that right? Wow, that's great. Happy birthday. And uh, get to spend it in beautiful Ohio. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. You don't, get, you don't get beautiful colors like this down in Florida, you know. And uh, so this is great. Good to have you this morning. Thank you for being here. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Let's give these folks a warm welcome, shall we? <laughs> One hundred ninety-three, one ninety-three. I traveled alone upon this lonesome way. Well, it's Jesus and me now. One ninety-three. Let's sing that. Uh, all three stanzas together as we uh, turn to one ninety-three. And it looks like we're having a changing of the guard here. That's great to have Sally back, and uh, she's going to play the next couple congregational songs. All right, one ninety-three together. <coughs> On that first together, 
I traveled alone upon this lonesome way. My burdens were heavy and dark with my day. I looked for a friend, not knowing that he Let's have the children be dismissed now. Go out to uh, Junior Church, and we'll sing that last all together. On that last, forever I'll sing of his great love to me. Forever I'll tell it on land and on sea. I'll stay by his side, contented I'll be. singing this morning. Let's turn over to 523. 523. I sought a flag to follow. 523. Let's all stand together as we find that. 523 together. <clears throat> On that first. I sought a flag to follow. Uh, let's uh, greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last uh, together. The pianist will uh, play through a couple of times.
We have, a, we have a vehicle over here on the side, a silver Kia Optima with their lights on. Silver Kia Optima. You may want to go get your lights out over here on this side, right over here, okay? Thank you. Ladies? together I sought for satisfaction for yearning deep within as you find your seats let's sing that last I sought for satisfaction for yearning deep within I sought for full deliverance from chains of guilt and sin I sought for peace and pardon for freedom from my fears. I sought a hope to cling to beyond these passing years. I found them all in Jesus, the life, the truth, the You may be seated. Our ushers will come, and they'll receive our offering this morning. You give us the Lord has blessed and prospered you today. If you fill out the welcome card, we appreciate you just putting that in the offering when it goes by. All right. Let's pray and we'll ask God's blessing on the offering. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for being such a great God. Now, Lord, help us to be in the spirit and, Lord, to pay close attention to what you have for us today. Father, help us not to take it lightly. Help us to be courteous while we're in your house courteous to your word that is being preached and taught. <coughs> Father, most of all, if there's one person here that does not know your son Jesus as their Savior, Lord, would you quicken his mind. And Lord, help that person to realize that they're lost and they're on a, a road to, that will have a dead ending. Father, we'll give you all the praise and glory for it. Bless this offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Kelly. And uh, another one from Florida that came back up for today. It's good to have her home for a visit, and that was a surprise, and a delightful one at that, and I uh, enjoyed that today. Take your Bible this morning, if you would, 1 Kings chapter 11, 1 Kings chapter 11 for our scripture reading this morning. We are going to read the first 13 verses of 1 Kings chapter 11. And we read them responsibly. We begin together on verse 1, then I read 2, and together on 3, and we alternate like that until we end together on verse 13 of 1 Kings chapter 11. And as our custom is here, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. <clears throat> let's begin together on verse 1 of 1 Kings chapter 11. Ready? But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And it commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, Forasmuch as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding, in the days, in thy days I will not do it, for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this morning. And Father, I pray that you would make our hearts ready uh, to receive the truth from your word. Lord, thank you already for the good music we've heard today. Lord, for the good spirit that's in this room this morning. Lord, I pray that you would continue to prepare our hearts and make us ready to receive the truth from the only book you've ever written. And I pray that we be yielded to you and what you would speak to us about today. Give us all ears to hear. And Lord, bless us special to that end, please. For we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Savior is mine. 
singing today. What a Savior. Father, we bow before you in prayer now as we come and open up your word today. And Lord, I pray you'd give us understanding as we look into your word and your spirit would speak to our hearts today. Lord, I pray that you'd help each one to give their careful attention to your word this morning and that, Lord, your will would be accomplished in each and every heart and life. I would ask the Spirit of God to move up and down these aisles and in and out of the rows and stop at every occupied seat and meet the need of every heart that's here. That's something only you can do. I pray you keep us from distractions, keep our minds from wandering, not, not focusing and therefore missing what you might want to say to us this morning. So Lord, take these next few moments that we'll spend together in your word and Lord, use them for your glory and for your honor. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm speaking this morning on the subject of the best inheritance you can leave your children. The best inheritance 
you can leave your children. And let me put your heart at ease this morning. It isn't millions of dollars. Okay? So how many of you say, that's a relief? Because they weren't getting it anyway. Amen? And uh, I... But in the heart of every parent, there is something in our heart that uh, wants to protect and care for our children. All right? We want the best for them. So we try to make sure that they're fed properly. We try to make sure they are educated properly. We'll try to make sure that they sleep when they ought to sleep and, uh, you know, uh, get up when they ought to get up. We make sure they get to the dentist or the doctor, whatever it may be, uh, that their needs are taken care of. But today, in the text we read, there's something that Solomon's father did that if we'll follow what he did, it's one of the best things, I think the best thing, you can ever leave for your children. And so we'll look at that today as we look into 1 Kings chapter 11. Now it's sad that Solomon didn't obey God, but the first thing I want us to look at this morning is looking at Solomon himself. The Bible tells us Solomon was blessed by God like no other. You know, he was given in direct answer to his prayer um, wisdom above anybody else that lived on the face of the earth. Uh, Not only that, he was allowed by God to establish a very peaceful time in the nation of Israel. And Israel enlarged its borders without fighting, without any wars being done. In fact, he accumulated wealth far beyond anyone else in all the earth. Uh, Solomon, it says earlier in 1 Kings, that he received his tribute given to him every year 25 tons of gold from other nations that they gave to him. Now that's almost as much as Bob Wallace has, but it's, it's a lot of money. And, and ton, 25 tons of gold. Solomon was wealth. In fact, when the Queen of Sheba, you know, when she came to visit Solomon and she actually saw it all herself, she goes, the half hasn't been told me. And usually, the hype is bigger than the real thing. You ever seen things like that? Boy, somebody builds it all up and you, you go to look at it and you think, that's it? This is what everybody was so excited about? Uh, when she got there, she goes, I can't, they didn't tell me half of how great this is. This is incredible. And she could not believe how great Solomon was. He was an amazing, amazing individual. In fact, God spoke to him directly twice. My friend, that didn't happen to many people. And it happened to Solomon twice. He didn't speak through a prophet as he did with David, Solomon's father. God permitted Solomon to build the temple, even though David wanted to. God would not allow David to do it. He allowed Solomon to build the temple and build a house for God. And, of course, Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs and wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. The Bible says he spoke over 3,000 Proverbs and songs and uh, his, in fact, his songs numbered 1,005. He was a brilliant, wise man and wisdom that came from God. So the obvious, the obvious question is, how can a guy who's this smart be this dumb? You know, how can a guy with this much wisdom get, get tripped up like he did? How, how could he let that happen? He, how could he turn his back? How could a man so blessed by God Turn his back on God. How could, he, how could he let that happen? Why would he build the, the, the uh, high places for the false gods? It talked about Chemosh, and it talked about the, it was the God of the Moabites and the Ammonites, all the, other, all the ites you read about when they, uh, that you mentioned earlier. They all had their own gods. They were similar, but they each had to have their own. But they were all idols. You'll, you'll read about how Gideon tore down some of those when, when he became the judge. And uh, Solomon built them up, and not just for those, but for every one of his wives. He built up idols for them to worship. You say, Solomon, how could you do that? God spoke to you twice in person. You heard his voice. You were given wisdom from God like none else. How could you, how could you do something so foolish? Look again at verse 9 of 1 Kings chapter 11. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel 
which had appeared unto him twice. And he had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. He turned away his heart from God. And that's what the Bible says earlier. His wives turned away their heart. Hey, you know how important your heart is? Your heart, you say, oh, my heart's pretty important. You know, if the heart isn't beating, I'm in trouble. Yeah, you're right, physically. But you know how important your heart is spiritually? Everything begins with the heart. The Bible says, guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. The events, the circumstances, the things that go on in your life are coming from your heart. We know that the things we say come from where? Come from our heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. All I have to do is follow you around for a few days and listen to what your speech is, what you talk about, and I'll tell you what's in your heart. Because your mouth reveals it. Okay? And, and, and that's not my philosophy, that's what Jesus said. But he says, your heart. When the Bible talks about salvation, look at Romans. Hold your finger there in 1 Kings 11. We're going to come back to that. But turn over to the book of Romans. Will you look there, please? Romans chapter 10. This is important that you get this. Important that we understand this. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Notice what the Bible says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe, where? In thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Nobody is saved by just saying something with their mouth. Listen carefully to me now this morning. Nobody's saved if I just say this prayer with me. You're just repeating a prayer. That's not found in the Bible. When, when the Ethiopian eunuch stopped and after, Peter, or after uh, Philip had explained the gospel to him from Isaiah 53, and he said, hey, here's some water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Remember what Philip said to him? He didn't say, well, pray this prayer with me, did he? What did he say? Believe, do you believe with all your heart? He said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Salvation is a matter of the heart. Are you listening this morning? Guys in the back, are you listening? It's a salvation is a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of, hell no, I'm okay. I prayed a prayer when I was six years old. Or I prayed a prayer when I was five years old. Where's your heart? You believe from your heart. Don't, don't rely on, on what's outward. Rely on what, where, where's your heart this morning. Where God is looking, He's looking at your heart. And what He saw in Solomon was not just the outward actions. That's what everybody else saw. What did God see? God saw His heart. God said, your heart's not... When the Lord Jesus said, the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your... The very first thing He mentioned. Love Him with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself. But it all starts with the core of your being. I'm not talking about that thing that's pumping inside your chest. The heart, the heart of the matter is the core of your being. It's when we say, when somebody does something and they're really doing a good job and they're really enthusiastic, we say, man, they really put their heart in that. What we mean is they're giving it every ounce of their being. Is that what we give to God? It's so easy to have our heart turned to something else. And, and Solomon allowed his heart to go away from God. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you know what he said? These people draw nigh to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Oh, I know, we came together and we sang, oh, what a Savior, or we sang, now it is Jesus and me, and we sing, a, there's within my heart a melody, and we sing the songs, and we hear everybody's words, but God looks through the congregation, and He's looking at our heart. He's looking to see whose heart is right with me today. Because man can only look on the outward appearance, but God sees our heart. Now, how's your heart this morning? How is your heart? Is it right with God? Is it where it ought to be? Think with me, secondly, what caused his heart to turn away?
What caused his heart to turn away? Go back to verses 1 and 2 of 1 Kings chapter 11, please. 1 Kings 11, notice again verses 1 and 2. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh. And it talks about the women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. Why not? For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And Solomon clave unto these in love. God had commanded His people not to marry women from these nations on earth because they'll turn their heart away from God. Because they'll turn their heart away from following Him. And, 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 and so He laid down the commandment. So you say, if that's the commandment, He made it clear to Solomon that He's not supposed to do that, why would He do that? Let me tell you why. Because He could. He's the king. He can do whatever he wanted to do. He was allowed to do it. He, he was permitted. He was the king. He could have what he wanted. You read the book of Ecclesiastes, you find out he got anything he wanted. If there's anything his eyes saw that was pleasing to him, he got it. When you get 25 tons of gold a year, you can pretty much do what you want and get what you want. And so he, nobody's going to stop him. Nobody's going to tell the king no. No one's going to say you can't do that. And besides, maybe he thought, hey, you know what, I'm too strong to be brought down by this. I know that's what God said, but you know what, I'm, I'm solid in my belief. I mean, God appeared to me in person. I mean, twice I heard His voice. And I, I know that God, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm deep in my faith. No one's going to move me. And so it's okay for me to do this. In other words, he got arrogant in his heart and he thought, well, the commands of God are good for everybody else but they don't apply to me. Anytime you get in trouble is when you think, yeah, that's a good commandment that God has. I know the Bible says that, but... And I'll, and I'll be kind, but I feel like telling you, well, get your out of the road. Don't put a butt where God put a period. Listen to me. The commands of God are for all of us. Don't get arrogant and think that they don't apply to you. And that it's okay that it won't, it won't get you. You'll tell the, your, your children, your, your, your boys and your girls that they're not to, not to uh, uh, they ought not date or not consider marriage someone who's not a believer. The Bible forbids the unequal yoke of a believer with an unbeliever. And if you're not to marry a believer with an unbeliever, don't date an unbeliever. Every date is a potential mate. You better understand that. Well, it's okay. No, no, no. He's a nice guy. Dad and mom, I'll, 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 I'll convert him. I, he, told, he promised me that after we're married, he'll go to church. Huh? Oh, my friend, there are numbers of people in this room who could testify to you that they thought the same thing. And it ended up tragically. My friend, God's commandments are true. And they're true for all of us. Don't ever get to thinking. We always think we're the exception and not the rule. Yeah, I know. I know what God's... But I, I can handle this. I know. I know that, you know, we, we shouldn't watch this because it has cursing in it. But, you know, I, I'm able to handle that. You're able to handle it until something happens to you that's hard or rough or somebody hits your car or you bang your hand on something and all of a sudden it comes out of your mouth and you go where'd that come from I know uh, you know what nothing ever comes out that you didn't put in okay and if you let it go in at some point it's coming out okay and it's not French okay and, and so understand the commandments of God are for everybody don't get arrogant and think it doesn't apply to you it applies to you. It applies to me. Don't think your faith is too strong to be watered down. Don't think your love for God is too profound to ever be damaged. And it's not unusual, and it's not 
it's not beyond our noticing that it was a woman that took care of Solomon or women that took care of Solomon and it can be the other way around as well. Oftentimes that's what leads us astray and our emotions get involved. Secondly, I see that the other reason that Solomon's heart turned away from God besides his arrogance is he spent time with the wrong people. When you read about the daughter of Pharaoh and the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Hittites and all the other ites that were in the land, those were the wrong people. You, you, you cannot run with the wrong crowd and live right. Those in, in our Reformers Unanimous program, the principle that, that, that they go by is this. Listen carefully. Those who do not love the Lord will not help you serve the Lord. Those who do not love the Lord will not help you serve the Lord. And you will become like the people you run with. You run with the wrong crowd, you're going to be like the wrong crowd. I've told you before, growing up, uh, my, my father and I went to a public school. My father could always tell when I was around the wrong guys. And I was, you know, I, 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 I was, you know, a teenager, and you think you know everything, you don't know anything. I could never figure out how he could figure out I was with the wrong guys. We could figure out because I was like them. My mannerisms would change, my speech would change, and I'd say things, and, and they'd, they'd know exactly who I'd been hanging around. Because you become like the people you hang around. That's why Psalm 1 said, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. See, the first three things God says is, you have to stop hanging around the people that don't love me. People who are against me and against God and against the things of God, you don't listen to what they say. You don't stand where they stand. You don't sit where they sit. And there is a progression there. If you, if you listen to their counsel, if you walk in their counsel, pretty soon you'll stand where they stand. Pretty soon you're sitting where they sit. Now, if you never do verse 1, you'll never get to verse 2, which verse 2 of Psalm 1 is, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Well, you'll never delight in the law of God if you don't get the wrong people out of your life in verse 1. They'll choke the Word and you won't have any use for the Bible. You will not have any use for the words of God. But to delight in the words of God, hey, for you to hang out with David and, and, and with James and John and with Peter and with Paul, for you to hang out with that, that crowd, that's a crowd to hang out with. Those are folks you want to be like. Time and time again through the years and I had people come to me and they say, I've got trouble sleeping. I have a hard time going to sleep at night. And, and, and I say, and inevitably I always ask, what are you doing before you go to sleep? And, and, and how many can guess what 99% of them are doing? Yeah, they're watching television. Well, I watch the news or I watch... Uh, uh, I don't even know who's on. It used to be Leno and Letterman. I guess they're both gone now, and there's two, uh, two other guys, I guess, on there. But they're watching these guys, and then they say, I have a hard time going to sleep. Well, quit going to sleep with them. I said, listen, do this for me. Take, take a week and shut the television off, and when you get into bed, get your Bible out and begin reading the Bible. And inevitably, you know what they always say? I'll fall asleep. That's what you wanted to do, wasn't it? Say, oh, but I feel guilty falling asleep reading the Bible. Don't feel guilty about that. The last conscious thoughts going through your mind are God's Word. You'll sleep better than you ever slept in your life. You, you know, and by the way, it, it, I've never had anybody come back and say it doesn't work. It works. Now, now, I don't like it much when they say I put in one of your sermon tapes and it went right to sleep, but I don't like that so much cure for insomnia. But when you hang out with the wrong crowd, you'll pick up their habits, you'll begin to use their terminology, you'll begin to look at your family or your job the same way they do. You begin to view God like they do. It changes your outlook. It changes your view. And it'll hurt you. You know, we have the 
two different prisons that we take the RU program into. And it is always an amazing thing to listen to prisoners. And we're rather new at this. I think May will be maybe two years. Will it be two years coming up? A year and a half or so we've been in one prison and just a few months in another. And so we're, you know, you learn to interact a little bit with the guys. And, and um, what's amazing to me is how they'll get advice from their parents or their attorney and some things that they should do. And uh, inevitably, when you talk to them later, you say, well, what did you do about that situation? They say, well, I talked to this other guy. They talked to another guy in prison. And he told me that I should do this. So, okay, let me understand. You didn't do what your folks thought you should do. You didn't do what your attorney thought you should do. You did what this guy thought you should do? Yeah. I figure, you know, he, he knows what he's talking about. I said, he's in prison. If he's so bright, he wouldn't be in prison. Wouldn't he be out? How easy we listen to the wrong people. How easy we listen to the wrong advice. In Bible college, it was always, well, let's see, should I stay in college? Should I go? I, gotta, I don't know what I'm going to do about paying my bill, and I don't know if I should stay. Who should I? And instead of going and talking to the, a professor or talking to the, the pastor of the church or talking to somebody in the college, you know what they do? They ask their roommates. What do you think your roommates want? Yeah, you need to go home, man. More room for us. <laughs> and your feet stink. You know, they, they, just, they don't care. They just want you out of there. Well, that's not who you talk to. But let me ask you a question. When you're faced with situations and you're faced with difficulties, who do you go to? Who do you talk to? Who do you get advice? You wouldn't believe, you wouldn't believe the amount of God's people that I hear, well, you know, I listen to Dr. Phil. <laughs> or Oprah said. I say, what are you listening to them for? What does God say? What does God say? What does the Word of God say? God, God gave you 66 counselors right there. And He's given you people in your life that can help you know what God says. My job as the pastor, when you come for account, my job is not to tell you what to do. My job is to tell you where you can go to find out what to do. Okay? I point you to, to, to where you can go into God's Word and find out what God wants you to do and go on His principles. Did you know, you, how many ever got bad advice from somebody? Huh? Yeah, if you're about over 12, you have, okay? Get bad advice from people. You know what I found out? I've never gotten bad advice from God. God has never led me wrong. He always gives me the right advice. I just have to take it. I just have to listen to it. I have to heed his advice. Pride blinded Solomon from seeing any of this. You've got to allow people in your life who can speak the truth to you and let you know when you... You ever hear somebody say you've got blind spots? By the way, we all do. You know what causes us to be blind? We're proud. Can I tell you, how, can I tell you the revealing thing? When somebody hits on what it is, and you say, what are you talking about? I don't got a problem with that. You're crazy. Oh, th that's it right there. That's your pride speaking. And you don't want to admit you got a problem. Okay? Solomon's pride blinded him from seeing what his problem was. His turning his heart from God. So what did God tell Solomon? Let's find out. Look what God told Solomon. He was angry. Verse 11. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon... For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant, notwithstanding. In thy days I will not do it, for David thy father's sake. But I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend away all of the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son, for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. God says, Solomon, I'm tearing the kingdom away from you. But wait, he said, I'm not going to tear it away from you. I'm going to tear it away from your son. 
Now, his son was Rehoboam. And all the kingdom would have went to Rehoboam. That's the way that worked. Okay? Went from father right to the son. But Solomon, he robbed his son of a great inheritance because of his disobedience to God. Did you get that? He robbed his son of a great inheritance because of his disobedience to God. Sad thing. But God says, notwithstanding. Notwithstanding. God steps in. Solomon has sinned. Solomon has disobeyed God. Solomon has turned his back on God. And yet, God withheld his hand of punishment in Solomon's lifetime. Even Solomon's son, Rehoboam, who is going to lose all the kingdoms but one, he didn't lose everything. He got to keep one. Why did he keep one? Why did God not do it in Solomon's time? Look at those verses again. Notwithstanding, verse 12, in thy days I will not do it. What's the next one, two, three, four, five words? For David thy father's sake. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, verse 13, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake. Wow. Why didn't he lose it all? Because there was an umbrella effect of David's faith in God that affected his children and his children's children. And it had a, an effect and a blessing upon it. Go to Exodus chapter 20. Would you turn there, please? Exodus chapter 20. Just take a left from 1 Kings, Genesis, and then Exodus, the second book of the Bible, and look at chapter 20. Most of you will know that's where the Ten Commandments are given. And notice what the Lord says, and He's talking about not making any graven images to bow down. And in verse number 5 of Exodus 20, look what He says. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Sometimes we focus a lot on verse 5 and the curse that God will put on punishing the sin of the Father under the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, those who want nothing to do with me. But however, the curse can be short-circuited. The curse can be circumvented, so to speak, because many men and women have lived lives that were against God and, and, and not for God and lived for themselves. They've angered God, so to speak, just as God said He was angry with Solomon. But something happens in their life and they come to realize that God does love them and gave His Son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for them. And if they by faith in Christ will trust Him as their Savior, they can receive eternal life. And they can be a new creature in Christ. And so they get saved. They trust Christ their Savior. And you know what? God turns their family around. And if you could look at that history, if you looked him up on Ancestry.com, you know, you'd look back and say, hey, wait a minute, something happened in this family right here. I see bank robbers and bootleggers and horse thieves and everything else. All of a sudden, boom, all of a sudden, wait a minute, here's preachers and missionaries and, and, and uh, educators and people serving God. What, what happened back there? I'll tell you what happened. Somebody got saved. That's what happened. And it changed things. Because he desires, the Bible says in verse 6, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. People who show love to God and will serve Him with their lives. God says, listen, you know where you'll see the blessing? Not just on your children, but your children's children. The blessing, the blessing isn't that my children are in church this morning, my grown children. The blessing will be when I see my grandchildren serving God and in church, doing what the Lord wants. And sadly, that's not always the case. We want that to be the case. And so, mom and dad, it's ultimately important that you love God with all your heart. And that you instill that love for God into the hearts of your children. 
The most important thing with your children, don't, don't just praise the outward. Praise the inward. Praise their love for God and the character of their heart. Don't just look on the outward. Now let me, David had a personal relationship with God. David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. Now, how many of you know, that mean, does that mean David was perfect? No, in fact, we know David's sin, don't we? David had some pretty big sins as far as we categorize sin. We categorize it, God doesn't, by the way. Sin is sin in God's eyes. We, we use big sins, little sins, you know, this and this and big. God, God just says it's sin. It's against me. But David had some pretty big sins. And his confession is Psalm 51. Where David, and that's what made the difference, David confessed it and he forsook his sin before God and asked God to cleanse him from that sin. And then David continued to live for the Lord. As far as David was concerned, the most important relationship in his life was his relationship with God. It was relationship with the King of Heaven. And David's relationship protected his son and his grandson, even when Solomon made a terrible decision and made some disastrous mistakes. Notice back in 1 Kings in, in chapter 11 and verse 4, the Bible says this, it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart from after other, after other gods. And notice what the Bible says, his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. God was looking at David's heart. I want to read something to you that I read this week. It's one of the saddest things you'll read. Um, it's a speech by Michael Jackson, a singer, and died of an overdose, I don't know how many years ago now. How many are familiar with Michael Jackson? I think most of you are. At Oxford University in March of 2001, he spoke and he said this. I want you to listen carefully. All of us are products of our childhood. But I am the product of a lack of a childhood. In absence of that precious and wondrous age when we frolic playfully without a care in the world, basking in the adoration of parents and relatives, where our biggest concern is studying for the big spelling test that's coming Monday morning. Those of you who are familiar with the Jackson 5 know that I began performing at the tender age of 5. Ever since then, I haven't stopped dancing or singing. But while performing and making music undoubtedly remain as some of my greatest joys, when I was young, I wanted more than anything else to be a typical little boy. I wanted to build tree houses. I wanted to have water balloon fights. I wanted to play hide and seek with my friends. But fate had it otherwise. And all I could do was envy the laughter and playtime that seemed to be going on all around me. There was no respite from my professional life. But on Sundays, I'd go pioneering. That's the term used for missionary work that Jehovah's Witnesses do. And it was then that I was able to see the magic of other people's childhood. Since I was already a celebrity, I'd have to don a disguise of a fat suit, wig, beard, and glasses. And we would spend the day in the suburbs of Southern California, going door to door or making the rounds of shopping malls, distributing the Watchtower magazine. He said, I'd love to set foot in all those regular suburban houses and catch sight of this shag rugs and the lazy boy armchairs with kids playing Monopoly and grandma babysitting and all those wonderful, ordinary, and starry scenes of everyday life. Many, I know, would argue that those things seem like no big deal, but to me, they were mesmerizing. Love, ladies and gentlemen, is the human family's most precious legacy, its richest bequest, its golden inheritance, it's a treasure that's to be handed down from one generation to another. Previous ages may not have had the wealth that we enjoy. Their houses may have lacked electricity, 
And they squeezed many kids into small homes without central heating. But those homes had no darkness, nor were they cold. They were lit bright with the glow of love, and they were warmed snugly by the very heat of the human heart. Parents, undistracted by the lust for luxury and status, accorded their children primacy in their lives. Pretty profound words. Pretty profound words. And he, and he hit the truth as far as love for your family, but can I, can I tell you something? You won't have the love for your family if you don't have love for God. It's empty. God is love. And love is of God. And one of the best inheritance, the best inheritance you ever leave your children is a love for God. A love for Jesus Christ. The best Best thing you ever leave your children is where they can, they can in their mind see you when they got up in the morning with your Bible. You spending time with God. You spending time with Him. You talking to them about the things of God. You bringing them to church. You making sure they learn what they need to learn about the Lord. But you having a relationship with Him. So I guess I, I want to help you to take your relationship with God seriously. It, it, it's more than just, ah, I don't have time to read my Bible today. Ah, I don't have time to pray today. What are you doing that for? What's wrong with you? And boy, we just, where's God? Where's God in our life? It's, it, it, be serious about it, mom and dad. You have a responsibility. You have something to leave to those children. And it's not just monetary. Place your faith as an umbrella of protection over their lives. They may make some foolish decisions, but God may be merciful to them for your sake. For your sake. May shelter them a little bit from the worst effects of their foolishness. And I hope you'll Realize that you can give no greater inheritance to your offspring than the inheritance of a godly mother or father. A godly mother or father. Children, the greatest gift you'll give to your mom and dad is give them a heart for God. Let them see that you have a heart for the things of God. There's no greater joy 3 John, I believe it is, verse number 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. There is no greater joy. I've said before, the biggest, the biggest burden I see that uh, people right now that I, that, I've, I, that I have to deal with in ministry are, are people who are in their 40s and 50s, 60s, who have grown children who are not living for God. That's a burden they carry. A burden on their heart. A prayer every day for God to touch their children. To see their children live for God. See their children have a relationship with God. The greatest gift you ever give mom and dad. The greatest joy you'll ever bring to them is not buying them anything. It's walking the truth. Walk in the truth with God. And mom and dad, a mom and dad that love the Lord whose heart is perfect toward God, as David's was. That's the best inheritance you can ever give to your children. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, I bow before you now, and we thank you, Lord, for the attention of everyone this morning. And Lord, I pray that each of us would examine our hearts today, and we'd be careful. In fact, Lord, I, I think we ask you to examine our hearts. And see if there's anything that is not right in your sight. And I pray that moms and dads this morning would have a desire and a passion to know you and to love you. And that their children would see that in mom and dad and say, I want that relationship with God that they have.
Touch the hearts of moms and dads this morning. Touch the hearts of children this morning. And Lord, I pray if there's any in this room today that they have never believed on Jesus Christ as their Savior from their heart, that they would trust Him from their heart today as their Savior. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Just, just between you and God right now, no one looking. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. But I wonder how many here this morning can say, Pastor, there's a time in my life when I knew that I knew that I was a sinner. And I knew that I deserved to pay for my sins in hell. But I also knew that God loved me and He sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. And Jesus died, He was buried, and He rose again the third day. He ascended back to heaven. But I realize He died for me. He died for my sin. And that if I would call upon Him and trust Him as my Savior, He'd give me the gift of eternal life. He'd forgive my sin. And Pastor, there was a day when I did that. I called on Jesus from my heart. And I asked Jesus to be my Savior. And Pastor, I know today that I'm saved. I know today that I've gone my way to heaven. Would you slip your hand up for a moment? I may see it and say, Pastor, that's my testimony this morning. God bless you. All right, you may put them down. There's somebody here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I don't know that there's ever been a time when I called on Jesus from my heart and asked Him to be my Savior. I'm not going to embarrass you. No one's going to go to you, but I'll pray for you. Would you let me do that today? Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? I don't know if I died, I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to know. I'll just remember you in prayer. Is there someone like that? You couldn't raise your hand the first time, but you'll raise it now. Would you do it? And say, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you. Moms and dads, children, message was to you this morning. I wonder how many here today would say, you're a mom and dad, and say, Pastor, I, God, the Holy Spirit stopped at my, my seat this morning. And I have to realize, I, afresh and anew, the importance of leaving an inheritance to my children of a love for God. I want, to, I want to model that for my children to see. And I'm asking God to help me to do that. Would you lift your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? Yes. Yes. Amen. Many parents today. God bless you. Grandparents. Good. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. If you're here this morning and you've never received Christ as your Savior, then when I'm done praying, we'll stand to our feet. The pianist will play. Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart this morning. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, just slip from your seat. Come down to the front. We have people who have been trained. They'll take a Bible. And they'll show you how you can know Jesus as your Savior. If you're here today and God has spoken to your heart, mom and dad, husband and wife, and you just want to come down and pray, you come and just kneel at the altar and talk to God. Whatever it is that Lord's dealt with your heart about, you obey Him this morning. Heavenly Father, have your way in this invitation time, please. Thank you for hands have been uplifted, indicating you've spoken to their heart. I pray for those in the room who do not know you as their Savior. That Lord, today would be the day that they from their heart would believe in Jesus and trust Him as their personal Savior. Lord, bless moms and dads, husbands and wives, children, They bow the knee before you today and, Lord, let them know that if they draw nigh to you, you'll draw nigh to them. Lord, give us godly homes where you're welcome and you're loved. Have your way now in this invitation and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist plays. As she plays, Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. You respond to him this morning. Will you please? Search me, O God, and know my heart to take. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray.
Our Father, we bow before you now in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for meeting with us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for decisions that have been made in the hearts of your people. Now, Lord, we need your help. Lord, we know we cannot do it on our own. We have to have your help. So help us to rely upon you to strengthen us and to help us to do what we know we ought to do. And Lord, help us to follow your word in all we do. May it be our guidebook. May it be our authority in our life. And Lord, may you honor the obedience of your people this morning. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for your word and the plainness of it. And Lord, I, I pray you'll help us to live the Bible we've learned this morning. Now, Father, dismiss us with your care. Give us a good afternoon and prepare us for what you have for us in store this evening in the service. We pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 All right, we're going to sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. In a You can all uh, take seats. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, today is, uh, can somebody, I think Kathy is in the nursery, isn't she? Is she downstairs? If you have children in the nursery, can you just bring them on up? That's fine. Uh, can grab the kids and bring them up. And Ten years ago, Pastor and Kathy came to Bible Baptist Church. And uh, how many were here ten years ago when they came? Wallace's, Anderson's. I think it's uh, really 10 years ago. I think it was Talladay's, Wa or, uh, Wallace's, Anderson's, and myself that are here. Um, Carol, Carol was here. That's right. That's right. Amen. All right, Kathy, can you come up? Carol Treadway. Very good. We, uh, we thought for 10 years we need to do something. And so um, we have a couple little things. Uh, if I can have Brother Neil, are you here? Okay. We have some... Flowers for Mrs. Slayball, and a card for Pastor. That's one of those every 10 years things. You'll understand it when you open it. <laughs> All right. And then uh, this is something that's, um, actually, I'll give this to you. We'd like you to go ahead and open it while you're here. Um, we just thought you might need that for the string. This is something that's a collaborative effort from the whole church. Worked on it for probably a better part of six months. And so, um, if not longer, you mean take this? This is uh, ten years of service encapsulated into one scrapbook. All right, um, a lot of hours, a lot of people have. Uh, we're hoping that you can take it home and look at it. We, we thought about setting it out here, but we want you to be able to really look at it and enjoy it and see it, but then we do want you to bring it back so that we can see it.
Um, so maybe Wednesday or even tonight if you get time this afternoon. But um, uh, that just uh, there's notes from everybody in there. There's pictures from everybody in there. But uh, we'd like for you to, yeah, you take that off. <coughs> so, um, so anyway, we, we just want to say we, we appreciate you um, greatly. And um, I, I, I guess I, I can probably say um, on behalf of everybody, 10 years ago when we, um, when we called you, I wasn't even a member at that time, but I, we as a church, and I, I think I can pretty safely say this, we're looking for a few things. One was somebody with a, a renewed vision, um, somebody with a real passion, somebody with a zeal, and somebody that was willing to let God use them to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And um, God's done that with you. And we pray that that'll be uh, continuing for many, many more years. But uh, we do have a uh, nice lasagna dinner out there uh, for you guys. And hopefully everybody will stay because there's enough for everybody. So don't be just, we, they don't want to eat 10 pans of lasagna. So, um, but uh, hopefully everybody can stay and uh, just really honor Pastor and Kathy with, um, with this uh, day. We do appreciate it so much. Uh, If you guys want to go back, we'll, uh, we'll sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Of the family of God, I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heads with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. All right, just one second. Brother Wallace, uh, before you do that, I want, Brother Wallace, why don't you come up? Would you uh, pray for the food so that when you go, go out, you can just go on right through the line and uh, uh, get started. We'll uh, pray, and then we'll uh, have uh, Sally play through it a couple more times, and we'll be dismissed, all right? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you again for uh, the tremendous work that you've uh, allowed us to be a privilege of, of uh, being in at, at here at Bible Baptist Church. And, Lord, we do thank you for our pastor and his wife. And, and Lord, uh, we appreciate... Uh, uh, their giving to uh, uh, to you. And now, Lord, we ask that you bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies, that we may continue to be a shining light in the Grove City area. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.